Hello and welcome to the next webinar from Strengthening the Heartland. I'm Amber Letcher, one of the program directors for the project. Uh, we're really excited to have you here with us today. As always, I'll give you a few reminders before we get started. First of all, um, if you have questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to type those into your question box on your control panel. Uh, at the end of the presentation, I will relay those to the speaker, um, but please feel free to type them in at any time. Um, we also ask that after the presentation, you complete a brief survey for us. This helps us get some feedback um, for every presentation. So even if you've watched a presentation before and you've taken our survey, please do that again. Um, you'll notice this time that the questions are slightly different. Um, so if it looks a little different to you, that's, that's why. Um, it's a little bit shorter, a little bit more streamlined survey for you. Um, and then lastly, if you'd like to follow along with the presentation, we do have the uh, handout linked in the handout section of your platform as well. Um, and with that, I am going to turn it over to our speaker today. This is Alex, and he's going to uh, give us some information on motivational interviewing. Welcome, Thank Alex. You. Thank you. Absolutely. I'm uh, really happy to be here, and thanks uh, for all of you uh, tuning into this. I think... Um, but motivational interviewing is one of those things where if you really just wanted like knowledge acquisition, uh, you should just pick up the book. There, there are a lot of good books. Uh, I'll, the one book recommendation that I would make is just the standard motivational interviewing, helping people change third edition. It came out several years ago. There's still another year or two out from coming out with a fourth edition. So if you don't have it and just want to know about MI, get the book. Uh, having said that, the, and the reason that I'm bringing this up is because uh, I don't want to just tell you things that you could find in a book, right? I want us to make sense of this. I want us to be able to talk about what motivational interview, interviewing is. I want us to start thinking about like how this fits in with the actual work that you do, uh, what it might sound like, and then we'll wrap up this presentation by talking a little bit, uh, or we'll go through an exercise together uh, where we're kind of understanding like what what does like best practice MI sound like with very, very specific like uh, client statements, which again, just gives us an opportunity to be kind of thinking and conceptualizing how to engage uh, from the uh, motivational interviewing perspective. Um, as Amber already pointed out, feel free to ask questions and interrupt. I'll leave some time at the end of the presentation for questions as well, but I have no issues stopping to answer questions. Uh, and then we'll just jump right in. <clears throat> We're just going to jump right into it. So uh, what you have on the, the screen right here is a technical definition of motivational interviewing. Uh, there's, a, I don't know, if I had 10 colleagues define motivational interviewing, uh, they'd all sound a little bit different, but the major components are going to be the same in each of those definitions. So this is the way, in, the way that I kind of define it, uh, me and my colleagues. But uh, what we have here, right, a collaborative communication style. Um, that works with a person to help resolve ambivalence while invo uh, evoking their intrinsic motivation. So throughout this presentation, we're going to talk about all of these different components. I'll talk about them briefly right now uh, as we kind of segue into everything else. But uh, I, th I think sometimes we as practitioners, and I'm a licensed professional counselor by trade, a counsel, uh, counselor by trade um, as well. So I apply this in a, a number of different settings. Uh, but I think sometimes we take for granted what being collaborative actually means. Uh, one of the things about motivational interviewing is that it's extremely nuanced uh, to it, an obnoxious degree. Uh, and one of the things that we need to be mindful of is everything that I say and do in an interaction will absolutely impact the person that we're working with. The questions I ask, how I ask them, the words that I use in the questions that I ask, uh, how I reflect, uh, again, the language that I use in my reflections will absolutely impact uh, every aspect of, uh, of that interaction. So when we say like a collaborative communication style, uh, by collaborative, we mean that the person is actively engaged in the conversation throughout the entire conversation. Um, well, what does that mean in terms of like, well, like how does that impact me as a practitioner? Think about it like this. If you went to a physician and your physician asked you 10 questions, uh, you're going to answer all of those questions, right? At the end of that exchange, at the end of the 10th question and the 10th answer, uh, as, a, as a patient, uh, what are you doing? 
you're waiting for the next question. There's no collaboration there, right? You're just, you're sitting there waiting for the doctor to either ask you another question or to tell you what to do and what type of changes that you need to make, right? So, so it informs so much, this idea of having a collaborative communication style really informs me as a practitioner, knowing that I need to be really mindful about how I ask questions, the frequency of questions, uh, and then to also develop other communication skills that are going to balance those questions out, knowing that if I ask too many questions, you're going to lose partnership, you're going to lose that collaboration. Uh, we're going to, uh, having said that, uh, we're going to move forward into talking about what motivation is, why motivation, uh, the concept of ambivalence, and then uh, the intrinsic motivation, how we respond to all those things. So we'll just keep plugging along, and again, feel free to ask questions if anything uh, comes up. Uh, so why, why motivation, right? Uh, motivation plays a role in pretty much everything that you do. Um, I woke up this morning just to th throw this out there, and I really wanted a coffee. It was like that was something. I was motivated to get up and to go get a coffee. Um, and throughout the day, different, th different things that we have to make decisions about and different things that we have to engage, uh, my engagement, my participation is going to be influenced by the degree that I want to be doing those things. Uh, I want to be here doing this presentation, uh, which is why I, I – trying to give my very best. I can't imagine if I didn't want to be here giving this presentation, it'd be very boring. I'd be very like droning on and be, oh, I don't want to be here. It's like it changes your style. So uh, motivation plays a role in so much of what we actually do. Uh, from a clinical standpoint, why motivation? Uh, we can influence it. As a, as a practitioner, whether you're a counselor, a social worker, a physician, a nurse, uh, whether you're a peer support, whether you're an educator, uh, you have an opportunity when we're working with people to influence a person's motivation, uh, not by asking like a series of questions. Uh, there are questions that can help influence that, but it really is this idea of uh, working with the person collaboratively and uh, supporting them and expressing their motivation to do something. And we'll continue to make sense of this as this goes on. Um, I said motivation and a person's motivation can be influenced by another person, uh, but I just want to point out that that can only be influenced in the context of a therapeutic relationship uh, and that partnership. If you don't have that partnership, if you don't have that sense of collaboration, you're going to have a really hard time and a really difficult time influencing uh, or guiding someone's uh, motivation in a particular direction. It only exists in that uh, therapeutic relationship. Uh, motiva uh, motivational interviewing as well is an evidence-based inter evidence intervention, and the reason that I'm pointing that out is because there's a uh, addiction psychiatrist named Dan, I think his name's uh, Dr. Campman, and he uh, once said or wrote, I forget which one, he said, uh, there's no such thing as an evidence-based intervention that's not grounded in the therapeutic relationship. And I'm, I'm just pointing that out to reinforce this idea that without a particular type of relationship where the person is actively in involved and wants to be working with us, it's useless. It's, you, can't, you can't do it. It's not going to work. It doesn't matter – uh, how savvy you are and what type of techniques you throw in there. If the person doesn't want to be with you and work with you, you're done. Well, not done, but uh, it's going to be a lot more challenging. Um, so what are the principal tasks? Uh, resolve ambivalence and evoke intrinsic motivation. Um, I said this morning that I wanted to go get a coffee. I was motivated to go get a coffee, and I know it's a really silly example. But I had like a five-minute conversation in my head this morning about whether or not I should go get a coffee or I should just make coffee here. I was very ambivalent about it, right? I wanted to go get coffee, and I didn't want to go get coffee at the same time. It was going to take me 10 minutes to go drive down there. It's going to cost me a couple of dollars or a few dollars to go get the coffee, and I'm trying to you know, save my money. So it's like those different uh, values and things are kind of at stake when I'm thinking about making this, this decision. Um, and in order for someone to make a decision to do something, um, we need to help first uh, help them resolve their ambivalence. And then, oops, sorry. And then we need to help in, uh, increase their intrinsic motivation or evoke their intrinsic motivation. Let me take a quick step back. Um, because I just I want to point this out. I'm sure we'll come back to it later as well. Motivational interviewing is about behavior change. 
It is about helping people make decisions and make change in their life. Always, typically, in the context of healthy decision making. And I'll give you an, a couple of examples to help you understand the range of possible target behaviors. Because motivational interviewing is only ever done in the context of a target behavior. If you don't have a target behavior, uh, how, you can't resolve ambivalence. You can't evoke intrinsic motivation to make a decision if there isn't a target behavior that you're trying to resolve. So I'll give you an example. I used to work on, uh, at a counseling office uh, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, it was like a six lane road. There's three, three, three lanes in each direction. And uh, this one client that I used to have, and this feeling was like 55. I had this client that used to ride his bike to my office, which terrified me to my core. Like it just terrifies me. I drive down this road and I know how I drive and it terrifies me that there's someone on this road that doesn't wear a bicycle helmet. And um, I don't know, it was probably like our third or fourth session, but I had talked to him and I said, uh, well, whatever his name was, I'll just call him Matt. I was like, Matt, I noticed that you ride your bike here and you ride your bike everywhere. I was like, could we talk about that for a little bit? And he's like, sure. And I was like, specifically, can we talk about bicycle safety? I set the target behavior. So at that point, like in the, in the context of applying motivational interviewing, I'm talking about bicycle safety. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to help someone. Me was trying to help this person move in the direction of understanding what's going on with his uh specifically not wearing a helmet and trying to see if I could understand uh, what his relationship is to him and his bike and biking and where not wearing a helmet kind of fits in with his lifestyle and why he's choosing to do that. And uh, I had to, and I did, I had to have this conversation where I really understood why he doesn't like to wear a helmet and understanding how, you know, all of these things about him in relation to wearing a helmet uh, and then strategically trying to resolve his ambivalence in the direction of getting a, a helmet and then increasing his expressed intrinsic motivation, which again, we're going to get to shortly, his expressed intrinsic motivation to actually do it. Uh, and in that conversation, at the end of that conversation, he came back next week and he had a helmet. And I think that's uh, really important, and it sounds really stupid, um, but it was I, I'd call that like a successful intervention. You can use motivational interviewing to address uh, any real target behavior uh, with with some limitations. There's uh, some ethics behind this as well, right? We shouldn't be using motivational interviewing to influence someone's decision making about things like uh, marital relations and. Uh, whether to stay married or get divorced. We shouldn't be using motivational interviewing to influence someone's decision about abortion, uh, organ donation, uh, uh, sometimes with domestic, uh, you know, intimate partner violence. Like we need to be really mindful about that, that I'm not trying to influence someone uh, because my value is saying I should influence someone. Uh, with something like bicycle safety, you can't really argue against that. The same way that you can't really argue uh, that excessive drinking is healthy, right? Like those are target behaviors that we can always gently guide people in that direction as long as they're willing to work with us and uh, we're also at a place of acceptance. Uh, so let's just keep plugging along. So what is our goal? We're, our goal is to influence change in the direction of, and let me move this around so I can see what that actually says because I can't see it. My screen's in the way. That happens. Yeah, healthy, healthy decision making, and that's really what we're trying to do here: is is, is move people in the direction of of making better decisions for themselves uh, that that improve their their quality of life or decrease potential risk in their life. So let's go to this concept. We're going to start with this concept of ambivalence. I'm going to share a video. There's no volume to this video. Uh, so you don't need to be listening for anything. I just want you to watch this video, and I'll tell you that um, the New York Times did a small research project. I don't think it was super scientific, but essentially what they did is they recruited people from the street and essentially just asked them to jump off a 10-meter high dive. So a 10-meter high dive is roughly 40 feet in the air and into a pool, right? Um, and I just want us to watch what happens with this uh, person who's going to be trying to jump off the 10 meter high dive. And then we'll come back and we'll talk about it.
so uh, let me let me switch back my screen real quick. And da, da, da. where are we? Here we are. One second. All right, so uh, I'd, I'd ask you all what you thought, but you're all kind of muted, so it's not a big deal. Uh, however, uh, what did we observe there? Inner conflict. You saw someone who both wanted to jump off and be successful in jumping off and at the same time not feeling like he was capable of actually doing it. And that's the experience that people – that is ambivalence. That is a, that's why I like that video. It is a physical representation of ambivalence. That, but, uh, and we could see it. He was walking up to the edge, looking over, walking back, not sure if he was going to be able to do this. That, that, that experience is something that happens internally for us all of the time. I experienced that this morning when it came to thinking about buying a coffee or not. Maybe not to the same degree. I wasn't as afraid to go get coffee, but I still had that internal conflict. And what happens is that when people are experiencing ambivalence and they're not sure what they want to do, what happens is they're, they get stuck. And they do nothing. The person uh, – we'll go back to that uh, the bike helmet example. Um, he, he was ambivalent about it. He really liked the idea of being free. What it meant to him to wear a helmet was to like take away some of his autonomy, right? Um, and that was kind of what was going on for him. And I had to uh, have a conversation with him and kind of uh, guide it a little bit where he was able to see that like – He's still free and safe, right? That he was able to uh, shift a little bit and we resolve that conflict. It was in resolving that ambivalence that gave him, gave him an opportunity to do what? To make a decision. And that's what it was about, where he was like, you know what? There's something about this. Uh, that Resolving that ambivalence uh, is a really important thing. What is – like if we're not resolving ambivalence – um, what are we doing typically? Um, and just as a, as a point of reference, I listen to people do motivational interviewing for about 25 hours a week. Uh, people listen to it, they re record it, and they send it to me, and then I code it and tell them how they did. There's validated coding instruments that we use to measure proficiency, and I spend a fair a, a lot of my time doing that. Uh, and I really enjoy that actually. Um, what was I going to – I forget what, where I was going with that. Give me a second. This happens sometimes. Um, the alternative, right? So I listen to people try and do this on a regular basis, and what I can tell you is this is not our instinct. Our instinct is not to help someone resolve ambivalence. That's one of the things that makes uh, motivational interviewing really challenging, right? You need to build a particular type of relationship where we're both actively engaged in this process. And then what happens? Typically in conversation, we identify a problem. And then uh, once we identify that problem as a practitioner, and I don't uh, – generally speaking, this is what people do. We problem solve. We give advice. We tell people what to do. With the gentleman – if I wasn't using motivational interviewing with the bicycle person, this is exactly what it would have sounded like. Matt, I'm really concerned about your safety. I see you riding your bike up and down, and I'm worried about you. I think it's really important that you think about getting a bicycle helmet. That's exactly what that conversation would have sounded like, and we do that all the time. We're constantly telling people what to do and how to do it, uh, and sometimes it's in, it's it's because we legitimately care and are concerned and there are safety concerns, and sometimes we do it because that's just what we think is appropriate uh, and because that's that's what we know. Um, we do, we uh, we We live in a space where it feels good to help people. And the way that we typically help people is by telling them what to do and by problem solving. Uh, it's called the writing reflex, R-I-G-H-T-I-N-G. I'm writing someone's wrong, right? I'm writing uh, a problem. And it's a really challenging thing to step outside of, but it's uh, to the nth degree important that we, if we're trying to do MI, try and address uh, that part of who we are as a helper. To step outside of this place of feeling like it's my responsibility to fix this person or to make them feel like, uh, you know, to give them something that I feel like that they don't they don't have, and and why? Uh, because no one likes being told what to do, uh, ever. Uh, find me one person. Actually, Bill Miller said that once. Someone asked Bill Miller, who's one of the two founders of motivational interviewing. Uh, he someone asked him the question. Uh, does MI work across cultures? 
And his response, which I thought was brilliant, was something along the lines of, I don't know anyone culturally who likes being told what to do. And I think that was so uh, fascinating and uh, insightful because I have never in my entire time found anyone also who likes being told uh, what to do. If I'm telling someone what to do, it only gives that person an opportunity to tell me why they can't do it and why it can't actually be done. And for me, that's a, that's a game changer. That, that, uh, that asks me as a provider to completely change the way that I'm thinking about someone and thinking about engaging a person, as well as, again, my responsibility to that, to that conversation. So build a relationship, resolve some ambivalence, and then we need to, uh, oh look, we had a debriefing slide here. I think it's okay, we'll skip that. Uh, what do we do after we resolve ambivalence? Uh, we move to in, in, evoke intrinsic motivation. So I'll, I'll give you, uh, let's see what's up next. Okay, we're good. So uh, where, does, where does this fit in and why is it important? This is, uh, roughly, very rough and watered down science behind MI, is that the way a person talks influences their behavior. And the more someone talks about doing something, we can predict a stronger relationship that that thing actually happens. So if you, uh, if you smoke marijuana and I'm your counselor, and that's what we've identified as the target behavior, but for whatever reason, I have you talking about how much you love getting high for 10 minutes. That's a predictor of you leaving my office and going to get high. Having you talk about it is, is a predictor of that, uh, especially in the context of you talking about how you like it and what you like about it and what you're actually doing with it. If I spent 10 minutes, uh, if you came into my office and you're like, I'm depressed, um, and I had I spent 10 minutes having you talk about how depressed you are, you might feel more understood by me but you actually don't feel any better. You've actually, I just sunk you into your depression by having you talk about your depression in the context of, of what's going on and what the problems are that are actually going on in your life. To, to, to again, to the point where it's like, we, and the, the science behind um, MI is, is, is very powerful and very strong. The way people talk influences their behavior. So uh, with the bicycle guy, I got him to a place where he was like, maybe I should wear a helmet. That's not where we want to end that conversation. When I have someone saying, maybe I should wear a helmet, I want to work as actively as I can to evoke this person's intrinsic motivation to go get a helmet. I want him talking about why he wants a helmet and what that means to him, what he thinks he'd – what that actually would look like for him. I want him imagining and talking about what – what it's going to feel like for him to wear a helmet and what it's going to feel like for him to be safe and maintain that sense of freedom and autonomy in that process, knowing that the more he talks about that, the more likely he is to actually go and do it. And I think sometimes people have a strong reaction to this because some people are like, well, it seems like you're manipulating. And it's like, uh, well, the answer to that is all clinical work is some form of manipulation. Uh, CBT, DBT, and CBT specifically, you're telling someone that their thought process is incorrect and then telling them how to address it. That That is a form of, of manipulation. Um, I wouldn't call motivational interviewing manipulative in any context specifically, and we're going to get to this in a minute, because it's grounded in a philosophy that really respects someone as their own decision maker and respects someone's, uh, you know, we're supposed to be demonstrating acceptance that if this person at the end of the conversation didn't want a helmet, uh, I should stop. I should really stop trying to influence that because they've expressed to me that it's not their priority. Uh, and that is something that, that I think uh, makes it so, so healthy as long as we can kind of bracket our own values about what's important and, and what we would like to see happen in the conversation. So uh, build a relationship, resolve some ambivalence, and then evoke intrinsic motivation. My job as a practitioner is to try and work with this person collaboratively to talk about their intrinsic motivation related to whatever target behavior we set out. So intrinsic motivation is a, used as a synonym uh, with change talk. Change talk and intrinsic motivation 
uh, for all intents and purposes, are essentially the same thing. An intrinsic motivation is any spoken language that favors movement in the correct dis direction, like the correct decision, right? Uh, so anytime that this person's talking about going to get a helmet uh, and why he wants to do that and why it might be important to him and uh, how he'll uh, potentially avoid risk as a result of that, it's intrinsic motivation. So there's two types of intrinsic motivation. We have preparatory uh, uh, motivation or change talk, and then mobilizing change talk or intrinsic motivation. And I, uh, I want to differentiate the two for a couple of different reasons. Um, I'll break it down for us and then I'll, I'll help us differentiate. So preparatory change talk is language that suggests someone is preparing to do something. So when someone says uh, desire, desire and importance are essentially the same thing. When someone is talking about why something is important or their desire, that uh, that's a intrinsic motivation. And it sounds like, I really want to get a helmet. I wish I could get a helmet. I'd like to get a helmet. Uh, ability, I could go get a helmet. I can go get a helmet. I'm definitely able to go get a helmet. Any language that suggests someone's confidence or ability uh, is falls under that category. Reason. Um, Getting a helmet would actually make me feel a little bit more comfortable on the road. That's a reason that someone might express to go get a bicycle helmet. And then a need. The difference between a reason and a need is a need tends to be attached more to an external um, consequence uh, versus a reason which is more just about your, your own uh, values and kind of what's going on within you. So a need might sound like, I need to get a helmet, or I really, I really want to go get a helmet because I know that if I get into an accident, that I'm, I, you know, I could die. It's that, uh, that consequence that you're, that the potential death or harm that creates more of a need to go get a helmet. And that is preparatory change talk. Uh, when someone's expressing those things, they're not telling you specifically what they're going to do, but that language does suggest that they're thinking about going to do something. And then you have uh, this mobilizing change talk where someone's expressing to you what they're going to do, that they intend to do something, activation, you know, what their steps are, what they're planning, that they're ready to do something, they're willing to do something, and then taking steps. Uh, and taking steps would be like uh, what happened in our follow-up appointment where he came back and I actively worked to in, uh, increase his taking steps intrinsic motivation language where I'm like, talk to me about what it was like for you to wear a helmet. Uh, and how did, the, how did that feel? Uh, where he's now telling me what he did and how it felt, because I know that the more he talks about how it felt, hopefully in a positive way, that the more he talks about that increases the likelihood that he continues to wear a helmet. Um, but I, I want us to understand from like a science from you know, whatever, yeah, from a science perspective, like uh, the difference between the two, right? So uh, I don't know if anyone has had to testify in court. And if you haven't had to testify in court, I hope all of you have seen Law & Order SVU. It's a fantastic show, right? So what happens, you go up on the stand, hand on the Bible, hand up to God. You swear to tell the whole truth, the, but the truth will help you, God. Uh, and what do they make you say? They make you say, I will or I do. Right? That is commitment language. That is literally an expression of, I commit myself to tell you the whole truth. Could you imagine going up there, I swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God, and then being like, I, well, I want to. Right? Like, that's never going to fly in the court of law. It's never going to work. You can't go up there, the whole truth, but nothing truth, so help you God, and be like, I could. Like it's not going to work for them. And, and, and that is the power of language and spoken language is that language is a predictor of behavior. So we want people that we're working with uh, in the context of any target behavior to, to get them to a place where they're saying, I really want to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm ready to do this. I'm thinking actively about what this plan looks like and I'm going to do it. That's what we're really after uh, uh, when, we're, when we're thinking about uh, in, uh, intrinsic motivation and evoking intrinsic motivation. Now, it sounds great in theory uh, and it is. It's difficult to do in practice for a number of different reasons. One is I need that relationship. I need to build that relationship with this person's actively working with me. In order to build that uh, partnership, I need to step outside of myself to some degree where I set aside my own values and beliefs and actively work to understand who this person is in relation to that target behavior and slowly guide them in, a, in the direction um, most people want to be healthy. 
uh, in that piece. And so um, when we're thinking about guiding people, it's never really about us. It's almost always done in the spirit of believing that people want to be their best self. And I don't think people, there are some exceptions and outliers for sure. Uh, I did crisis work in the, in the community in the city of Pittsburgh for several years. So I understand that uh, uh, we all have different values and, and uh, things that are important to us that influence uh, what that best self actually is. Um, so we shouldn't be superimposing ourselves, our will, and what our values are. Uh, but generally speaking, like people want to be healthy, and um, our job in conversation is to create the right conditions for that best self to be expressed uh, in language. Okay, so how does this actually work in practice? Uh, I kind of already talked about it, but build a relationship, identify a target behavior, work to resolve that ambivalence while we're increasing uh, and evoking this intrinsic motivation. So typically in conversation, I don't get that commitment language, right? Very, very uh, rarely, and by rarely, I mean it's actually uh, never happened in a genuine way where someone shows up and they're like, I'm ready to do it, man, let's just do it. Typically there's always, mobilizing change talk is, is a lot stronger when it's grounded in preparatory change talk. And that's kind of what this model shows right here is, uh, when someone shows up to me and they're like, I'm ready to make all these changes, I'm kind of suspicious of that. And it's not that I slow that person down and I'm like, I don't believe you. Uh, what I do do, though, is I, I uh, encourage this person with questions and good reflective listening to express their desire about why. Like, John, you're saying that you're really ready to do this. Talk to me about why that's so important to you, where I'm, I'm getting someone to express more of those reasons. And it's like, John, you sound like you're at a place where you're ready. What does that look like to you? And now what are they doing? They're expressing a sense of ability. Again, knowing that the more they talk about it, the more likely they are to do it. So we're actively working at uh, building this preparatory change talk and uh, encouraging this. And then what happens is uh, they express enough of it where they start actively expressing commitment language. It's in the expression of commitment language that we can expect people to start taking steps. And when people start taking steps, we start to see behavior change. We start to see people making actual change. Uh, and that is really the nuts and bolts of what MI is about. Uh, I just I just gave you two days worth of information in 25 minutes. So I understand that that's a lot. So I will just pause momentarily uh, for anyone who has any questions related to things that we've covered uh, before we move on to the next piece. And you can feel free to type those into the question box or even the, the chat box. And I can get those to Alex. We'll give it another minute. And if not, we'll just jump back into it. I don't see anything in there. So, so we'll, we'll just jump. We'll just keep moving along, which is fine. And okay. Time flies, right? My goodness. We're going to have to jump around a lot. Uh, so let's just, I'll just say this real quick. So we're building that relationship based on that collaborative communication style. But MI really is grounded in like a philosophy and way of being with people that I think is really important. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this. Uh, talking about this, but I want us to be I want us to be aware of it that in order for motivational interviewing to be effective, in order for me to help someone resolve their ambivalence about a target behavior and then evoke that intrinsic motivation, I need to present myself and communicate in a way that fosters <laughs> excuse me foster these these four things partnership, working with this person, having them actively engaged, acceptance, demonstrating a sense that this person is their own decision maker, that even if something isn't in their best interest and maybe I want something better for them, that it's not my job. It's not necessarily my job to make someone want something that they don't want for themselves. In fact, acceptance gives someone an opportunity to be open with us because the second that I communicate what my values are and what I think you want to do, you're less likely to be open to me because you're, you're, you're going to be moving from this assumption that I'm going to be judging you. 
Uh, compassion, uh, uh, I'll talk about it in a little bit. Empathy is different than compassion for a couple of different reasons. Compassion is to be with someone and their pain or their struggle or uh, whatever that actually looks like. Empathy, generally speaking, because uh, sometimes I think we uh, we mix them up. Empathy is literally my ability to communicate to you what you actually haven't said to me, but what is true for you, i.e. good reflective listening, accurate, complex reflections that communicate to you, I understand you, give the client the experience of feeling understood. And uh, that's extremely powerful. You can be compassionate without actually having to say anything, which is very, very different just by being with that person, active listening, good eye contact, uh, good nonverbals, in addition to good uh, accurate reflecting as well. And then lastly, uh, this, this, uh, this concept of evocation, that it's my job to pull out from you and draw out from you what's going on and your motivation. Meaning I can't tell you something, right? The second that I told this bicyclist, uh, it's really important for you to get a bicycle helmet. I'm not evoking. I'm telling. I'm prescribing. I'm persuading. And it has really damaging effects, both in terms of the relationship and in terms of what this person's actually going to do. I did an exercise with a group of 30 nurses. Uh, this is a while ago. I did an exercise with a group of 30 nurses. And at the end of the exercise, every single one of those nurses identified as, I tell people what to do, that's how I help people make change. Every single nurse said that, and we're comfortable with that. Uh, that's what they do. I just tell people what to do, and I then ask this follow-up question to them. Raise your hand if you like being told what to do, and not a single one of them told uh, raised their hand. And it was such an aha, like light bulb moment for them to realize, like, wow, the way that I think about helping people isn't a way that I would like to be helped myself. And it's like, well, if I if I don't like being helped that way, the people that I work with certainly don't like being helped that way. And it's like, well, if I'm not going to help that way, I need something else. And that's really, again, where MI comes into play. It's about uh, uh, within the, the, the spirit of these four things right here that I have an opportunity to build that collaboration, identify target behavior, which is a, ne a necessity, uh, resolve that ambivalence, and then work to increase that intrinsic motivation. All right, so how do we do that, right? Uh, there are, if you work in the healthcare field, actually don't do this, because they're, they're coming out with another edition. So there's a fantastic book that I think it's called like MI, it's, if you just if you just like went to Amazon and were like, am I in the healthcare field? It'll pop right up. It's a book written by Stephen Miller. I'm mean, sorry, Bill Miller and Steve Rolnick, uh, which I think is a really great book. And it's uh, this is what we're going to cover. It's written specifically. It's a little bit different than the MI third text, uh, but they're coming out with a fourth edition shortly. Uh, if it's not all, I don't think it's out, um, but should be out shortly. So I just hold on to it. But these are the three core communication skills that I use when I'm. Um, working with a client. And this is it. Uh, you could flesh these out and uh, be a little bit more detailed than depth oriented, but generally speaking, I'm either asking questions. I'm either listening by either nodding my head or good reflective listening, or I'm informing you. I'm providing you with data, facts, information, or my own personal beliefs and thoughts. That's it. I'm asking, listening, or informing. Uh, and anything that I say, typically falls under one of those three things. So let's talk uh, just briefly about reflections. Reflections are the bread and butter of motivational interviewing. If you can't reflect back uh, in a, with complex reflections, you will not have a lot of success in motivational interviewing. Because uh, if we're not using reflections, it means we're asking questions. And while questions are important, uh, while questions are important because they express curiosity and interest um, and care and concern, uh, too many questions starts to pull us apart. It starts to divide us. It starts to take away from that partnership. So it's like once I'm starting to build that relationship and there's this sense of trust that's being developed, I want to transition into reflections where I uh, am um, responding to you and this is what a reflection is. It's a statement I give back to you in response to what you just said uh, that either adds depth, direction, emotion, um, or value. And that is how we navigate. When we talk about influencing a conversation, we do that with complex reflections. Literally, the words I use in my reflection will dictate what you say next to me.
and how you respond, especially if the relationship's in place. And I'll say that real quick. Reflective listening is uh, is not really effective if you don't have partnership. Uh, you'll get a lot of short, short answers. Uh, and when you're getting a lot of short answers, it's an indicator that the partnership isn't well established yet. Uh, so we have simple and complex reflections. A simple reflection literally just parrot backs or mimics what the person's just said. So if I told you, I'm really hungry for lunch, the simple reflection would be, you're ready for lunch or you're hungry. Uh, and this is a really stupid example as well. Uh, but a complex reflection, again, uh, it doesn't mimic or parrot. It adds something to what the person just said. Uh, so if I said, I'm really hungry, I'm ready for lunch, uh, my response to that could be, you didn't get a full breakfast. What's the person going to talk about? They're going to talk about breakfast. They're only now, now. Now the question would have been, well, what did you have for breakfast? But like that's a really off-putting question. That is just me wanting to know about you and what you had for breakfast. The reflection maintains that partnership and builds partnership, as well as expresses empathy if it's accurate. Now the response to that would be, my God, yeah, I just didn't have time this morning. I didn't have enough time for breakfast, and the person feels understood, or that reflection is wrong, and they're going to correct me and tell me exactly what it's about. So the client said, or I say, um, I'm really hungry and ready for lunch. And you say, uh, you didn't get a, you didn't get a big breakfast this morning. I could say, oh my God. Yeah, I know exactly. Or the response could be, no, it wasn't that I didn't get a good breakfast. I just have a killer lunch and I am so excited to eat that lunch. And then we can carry on that conversation, right? So it's not wrong or bad. It's not an unhealthy thing to be wrong in our reflective listening. If the partnership's there, cause they're just going to correct us and help us move along in that process. This is a skill that is, uh, generally speaking, everyone thinks that they're really fantastic at and the majority of people struggle with. And it's not to say a, it's not it's not a bad thing. It's not, you know, reflective listening is not like riding a bicycle where if you didn't ride a bike for 10 years, you could get back on and do it. Uh, it requires regular practice. And in the spirit of transparency, um, I, I record myself doing my clinical work on a regular basis and send it to an outside uh, mentor who then codes it and gives me back feedback because I'm also aware that I can't objectively listen to myself work and then critique myself, right? I need someone else to listen to it and then tell me what is good and what is not good and what needs to be improved on, uh, which is something that I would encourage everyone to do. Then we have questions, uh, and uh, for time's sake, I'm gonna continue to like move along because uh, we're all in the questions. It doesn't matter. I don't care if you ask open or closed ended questions. What I'm more concerned about is why are you asking that question? And that's something we need to be mindful about. Like the question of, well, what did you have for breakfast? That's just about me believing that your hunger had something to do with you missing breakfast. Uh, it's not really a, a good question. So we have those three uh, core communication strategies, and then we have the three styles of communicating, meaning that in conversation, I'm either following guiding, uh, or let me move this last one because I can't see it, following, guiding, or directing a, a person in conversation. Anything I say is going to suggest that I'm following you, I'm guiding you, or I'm directing you in conversation. So let's take a look at what this kind of looks like uh, for us. So when I'm following, I'm listening. Uh, when am I following clients? I can follow clients in conversation who are really active about addressing problems, right? I don't need to direct a client who feels like they have a good handle on things. I might guide them still a little bit, but I'm going to take more of a following role uh, and be a little bit uh, like in terms of like how I'm responding with my reflections. I'm not going to be as directive. When I'm guiding a client, I'm going to be actively trying to move someone along with good reflections and questions, really moving them, right? So I couldn't and the, use the example of the bicycle person, right? The helmet. I couldn't follow him in conversation about getting a bicycle helmet because it wasn't even on his radar. I needed to point that out to them and then guide him towards that decision. He was, I, I could never have followed him because he would never have gone to a place where he was saying, I need to do this. Um, but that's what that looks like. Uh, it's finding that balance of like, where is this person at? And how do I need to adjust my style of communicating to move this person in the right direction? So following the clients, um, oops, sorry. 
Okay. So again, when do we follow a client? Uh, when we're building that therapeutic relationship, when we're trying to get a better sense of what the actual problem is, uh, who this person is in relation to whatever the identified problem was. Uh, so here's some examples of what following looks like when we're asking, informing, or listening. It might sound like, how have you been handling all of this stress? That is a question that puts the client in the driver's seat completely uh, to express uh, you know, what is true for them in relation to that question. If I'm informing, it might sound like it's a common experience to feel this way when someone is feeling depressed. I'm, I'm giving them information. That is information, but it's information that allows them to extrapolate on that and add to it and do whatever else they want to do with that, uh, but also validates and normalizes a little bit. And then that last piece, you've been really, uh, uh, you've really been struggling with this. Uh, it's a reflective statement that communicates I heard you and understand you and still completely allows you to stay in the driver's seat, right? I am not guiding someone with that, uh, it, but prompting someone to continue to talk about how they're struggling. So what does guiding sound like with those examples? <clears throat> Uh, and again, I'm going to guide someone in conversation, but I'm not as confident that they uh, have the ability or uh, or uh, the wherewithal, or maybe they're stuck with an ambivalence. We need to resolve all those things. So uh, asking, informing, listening, what type of support do you think would be helpful? That I'm guiding the that I'm guiding that person to talk about what type of supports they need. Now I'm not telling them, which I'm not. Uh, well, I'll get to that in the next one, right? So. What type of supports do you think would be helpful, right? Uh, that's an asking question that is guiding you to talk about something that I think you need to talk about. Uh, the informing, a lot of people your age have found it helpful to exercise and boost self-esteem. What do you think about that? I give you information, but what makes that more in, uh, guiding is that I'm asking you to tell me now what you think about that. I'm asking, I'm prompting you. And again, why is that important? That uh, question of why do you, what do you think about that is that the, the, the next thing that is probably expressed is will probably be change talk, right? That's what we're after. We want someone expressing and talking about what type of support, all these, all those things. And then lastly, you're concerned about your friend and you want the best support possible. Um, again, I'm guiding them to talk about what they need without giving them complete free range to just go off and, and uh, stay where they're at. And then lastly, directly, uh, when am I directing? I'm typically directing in conversation when... Um, when I need to uh, talk about some practical things, when there's a safety concern, uh, when someone's really not getting it, um, or there's a lot of different times where we're going to be more direct in conversation. Um, I'm more direct in conversation typically, well, it'll have to be for, for another, another webinar because I could drone on about it all day. Uh, but here's some examples of what that sounds like. How often do you think about cutting yourself? That is, an, that is a direct asking, like a question that is very directive. I'm asking you to tell me specifically about one specific thing. Uh, I'm informing, your best option is to talk to a crisis counselor. I'm informing you and being very direct about what I think is in your best interest. And then you need help figuring out what your best options are. I'm still listening. It's a good reflective statement actually that guides you specifically to talk about next what your best options are. Um, so, I, that's a lot. That's a lot to stomach. I could probably spend a week talking about all of this stuff uh, and helping us flesh it out and doing like a lot of different exercises. So I know we don't have a ton of time left. We're going to take a few minutes and go through some of these um, exercises, and then we'll wrap up in a couple of minutes. If anyone has any questions, and still we'll be done at twelve as promised. So I, this is a client statement, and then there are four options. And what I'd like you to do, if you're willing, uh, and a, a being sensitive to time, uh, what I'd like you to do is type into the chat box what you think is the best answer, and you can just type in A, B, C, or D. And uh, it's all anonymous, so I can't, I can't see, not that it would matter anyway. Um, so I'll read the client statement. I'm just so tired of all this. I've been working so hard to take care of things and nothing seems to be happening. What is the best response? What is, and by best, I mean the most am I consistent, right? In your own mind, you might think uh, one answer is better than the other. I want you to think about what is the best uh, am I answer, the most consistent am I answer based on what we've talked about so far. And I know that uh, we don't know a lot of the background context, et cetera, et cetera, but it just gives us an opportunity to think. So uh, take a look at those uh, answers and then let me know what you think the best answer is. And I'm going to figure that out for myself as well while you're looking at it because I don't have it. I don't have an answer key. <laughs>
looks like we've got a few answers coming in here. Okay, I've been working so hard to take care of the things, nothing seems to be happening. Okay, uh, and I can't see I can't see the answers. They're coming through for me. So it looks like consensus is D. Uh, wow, that makes me so happy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that it is a great answer. Why? You're really hoping things will pull through soon. If you look at all those other examples, you're dragging someone back down. Like there are definitely some things you haven't tried yet, which might very well be true. But what that suggests is that the client hasn't been doing everything that they could be doing. Uh, and it's kind of like, just has like this negative connotation to it. I know this is difficult for you, but you have to keep trying. That's what we call cheerleading. Uh, Cheerleading has a small, small place in our clinical engagements. And uh, where I feel like it can be really helpful is with clients who don't have hope. I think sometimes when clients don't have hope, sometimes they need us to be in their corner for them. And that can be really powerful. But generally speaking, cheerleading is a really obnoxious thing for a client to experience. Uh, I'm so sorry things aren't going well for you. It's actually a really good response. That's probably the next best response. But in the context of motivational interviewing, I just prompted someone to talk about how things aren't going well for them. The next response to that, someone's going to talk about how things aren't going well for them. Answer D is definitely the correct answer, and they'll elaborate that. You're really hoping to uh, pull through soon. Uh, typically, potentially, as long as that relationship's in place, we'll move to a place where like, oh my God, I really, I really need things to change. When someone says, I really need things to change, that is change talk. And we're moving that person in the right direction. So uh, very good. All right. So I'm just so tired of all of this. I've been working so hard to take care of things and nothing seems to be happening. All right. So uh, if you don't mind sharing with Amber what you think is the best am I consistent response and then we'll she'll share and we'll go from there. Wait, I'm going to go to the next one. I lied because uh, I want to. Uh, I just don't know what to do. Will you just tell me so I can start taking care of things? There's yeah, there should be a range of answers because as I'm looking at this, I'm like, I don't know. Uh, there's a there's because there's a couple of good answers. So if you don't, uh, where are we at, Amber? How's that? What, what's it look like? It looks like we're kind of in between D or B. Well, obviously not C. You just don't know what to do, right? It's actually a, again, it's a really good reflection, but pro it's gonna you're gonna get sustained talk. Sustained talk is any language that favors the status quo, and that's what you would get there. You have all the answers you are need within yourself. Answer A isn't terrible. I would never in a million years say that to a client, right? But A, a isn't bad, technically speaking. Uh, so I'm torn between B and D. If I'm thinking about this, um, I would go with B, and I'll tell you why. Uh, D is a good answer, and actually, if they're both good answers. In this moment, I would choose B. And uh, and the reason I wouldn't choose D is because this person's saying, like, tell me what to do. And I'm and I'm reflecting back, uh, uh, you just need some direction. All this person's gonna be like is like, yeah, I just asked you, give me some direction. I feel like would be a, a response to that potentially. But what we're doing when we say, how have you managed difficult situations similar to this in the past? We're actually prompting someone to express change talk, that sense of ability. We're asking someone to actively think about a difficult situation and how they overcame that. And in that process, they should express change talk. Uh, and, and this is also true. I'm pretty mindful about when I use this and how I might ask that question. Um, I've never had anyone be like, I've never had to manage a difficult situation before, right? Like, so it, uh, typically people aren't uh, challenging like that. All right, let's do one more and then we'll close up for questions. Everyone around me is telling me I have a problem, but I feel, I feel fine. Uh, where oh, are we at? Looks like, looks like B and D again. So, uh, so, so definitely not D. And I'll tell you why not D. You should consider listening to those around you. It seems like they really care. Uh, I, uh, if I, if that's my response, I'm literally engaging in confrontation. I just become became confrontational because this person's saying I don't have a problem, and your response is, but people are telling you you do, and you should listen to them. Uh, mm -hmm. 
And it's it's not a terrible answer. It's just not the best answer. Uh, a isn't the right answer. I, a, I think when I wrote A, I think I left half the answer off. That happens sometimes. Um, B and C are good answers. You're willing to lose those relationships in your life uh, to keep drinking. You have to be really careful about that answer. Uh, it's actually what we would call an amplified reflection. And the, the hope would be that their response to that would be, well, I don't want to lose these relationships. And that person in that moment is now at a place where they understand the gap between what they're saying and what they're actually doing. Uh, I like B. I think even if your drinking isn't a problem to you, it's causing problems in relationships in your life. What we're really doing there is highlighting that, like, let's not even talk about the drinking then. Like, let's just talk about the issues that the drinking is causing in your life. Moving this person closer to understanding, again, the gap uh, between his values of I like drinking and these people are important to me. This person is not resolved yet. This person's still ambivalent. Um, and, and that's kind of what needs to be resolved. The best way to do that is uh, to understand who this person is, what their values are, and then again to help resolve that, that conflict between the person's values and what they're actually doing. So I know we're short on time. We won't do any more of these, but uh, if there are any questions that someone has, things that people want to talk about or know about, uh, now, is, now is your chance. I can stay a few minutes past 12 o'clock if people want, if people have questions that I don't, I don't mind answering. So yeah, feel free to type those in um, and I'll give them to Alex. Um, as we give people a couple minutes to write, one thing I'm wondering about is, I mean, obviously MI is a, it's a, a, a clinical practice, you know, you need training in it. Um, are there aspects of MI that, you know, people who aren't trained or non-clinicians might be able mm -hmm. to use all of it. I mean, that's one of the things that I like about motivational interviewing is that this is this was designed, and I'll try to not be long-winded, but this was this was developed in the context of uh, addictions and uh, you know treatment, and uh, but it was designed in the context still of as a brief intervention. Uh, this is not therapy. This is not therapy. Uh, this is used as a brief intervention to help people make healthier decisions in your life. So you don't need Clin does clinical training, what I will tell you is that sometimes the most difficult people to train in motivational interviewing are the people who have 30 years of clinical experience. Uh, and that sometimes actually you don't need a clinical background at all to, uh, to be successful with this. I think everyone's path to developing proficiency or developing a competence in MI is unique and specific to their own personal development, but anyone could potentially learn MI and apply it uh, in a, in a work setting. And I'm very careful to say in a work setting because um, I I know this stuff. I do it really well. I could never, ever in a million years use this with like my child or my family or a friend. And the reason I couldn't is because I'm too emotionally involved in that relationship to be objective and to demonstrate acceptance. Um, so, so you can use this with any potential target behavior as long as it doesn't cross like the ethics that I kind of talked about at the beginning. And um, Path, your path to mastery is really just dependent on who you are uh, and how how hard you're willing to work to get to that place. And that was actually a, a kind of the next follow up question was what about a parent who might want to use this in a family setting? I so just, I, I've had people say that they can and I, I just don't think it's possible. In fact, Bill Miller once said, you know, if I had a son who is struggling with I don't know what he says specifically, but it's like if I had a son who was dealing with like hair problems related to heroin, I wouldn't jump into my MI hat. I jump into my parent hat. It's not the time to do MI. It's a time to be a parent. It's a time to like take that directive stance and still be supportive and loving, uh, but also to to do what you feel like you have to do as a parent. I personally can tell you, um, and I've tried before. It's really really difficult to not want to fix problems that we have. So what I would tell you is you won't. I don't think you'll be able to do MI with a family member or a child, but what you can do is be more mindful about how you're interacting with your child and to try and avoid that writing reflex, to try and empower your child to continue to make the right direction, right decision is something you can do, but that in itself doesn't mean you're doing motivational interviewing. It just means that you're being a good communicator. Yeah, I would think some of that reflective listening might be appropriate. Yes. Yeah. yeah, but it's really only MI when we're doing that reflective listening in the context of that relationship, identifying that target behavior and increasing that intrinsic motivation. 
Okay, we've got one more question here. Um, so someone is asking about they're a healthcare provider and they do need to educate their uh, patients, clients in some ways. Um, but what is maybe the most time effective way to support their autonomy, uh, but also teach them? Uh, something? I know. We need, we need, we need, a, we need a whole another webinar. Uh, I could, there's, a, there's a strategy, right? So a long time, historically, we used to have a strong reaction to giving advice or providing information because uh, they used to say, don't do it. And then I think what they've uh, realized pretty quickly and what they've accounted for is an understanding that a good chunk of what we do is providing information and giving advice. It's not to say that giving advice or information or even helping to problem solve is wrong, but the, the way in which we facilitate that process actually matters a lot. And we don't have time to go through it, but there is a technique called illicit provide illicit where which does take practice and does take time we would have to like go through it together but mm -hmm. when you shape uh, your information or providing information or advice in the context of this format this construct epe uh it's really really helpful uh because you're doing it in a way that builds partnership and trust and giving someone uh, yeah, like I said, I don't have time to actually go through it. Uh, I just drone on for another 10 minutes, which no one wants me to do. Um, but it's definitely something that can be done. And healthcare practitioners who are being trained in MI, that is one thing that they're uh, being heavily trained in, uh, this construct of illicit, provide illicit, because it's important to provide information and advice. Uh, I do it all the time, but the I use this construct to do it, which, which has been a, a game changer in terms of how a person receives my information and advice. Okay. And that might be if if our participants are interested in learning more about that, you know, fill out that survey and we can maybe organize another webinar around that. We're happy to do that. Um, you can also reach out to me if you have questions um, or thoughts or things that you want to um, to follow up about or whatever. Uh, I'm relatively responsive as long as um, well, I'm relatively responsive regardless. So if you, if you need anything, just uh, don't hesitate to reach out uh, as well. Okay. We can share your email address. We'll send out a, a follow-up after this webinar. Great. Okay. Um, yeah, and somebody already said they're very interested in the provide illicit. So yeah. we'll, we'll look into that. Great. I appreciate you, the opportunity to be here and thank you for, for listening. And uh, like I said, if, if you need anything, just uh, let me know. All right. Thank you so much. Um, you will be receiving a follow up um, message with this link to the survey and also a way to access this recording. So uh, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, Alex. That was wonderful. Great. Thank you.